Well, hello there and good afternoon to all of you listeners. And thank you again for joining us for our Masters of Public Health webinar for Bastyr University. Welcome and we're so happy to have you. My name is Emily James. I'm an admissions advisor here at Bastyr University and I am joined here today by Dr. Barbara Godolftis, who is the chair of our public health department. Over the next hour or so, um, we will be going over the details of our public health program and what is available to learn here at Bastyr and also what you can expect within the program. Towards the end of the presentation, I'll go over some of the admissions details and what's important um, as of dates or deadlines for the programs and prerequisites to get into the program. And if you have any questions throughout today's presentation, please feel free to enter them in the box that you see at the side of your screen. Those questions will come to us directly at the end of the presentation, and we will do our very best to address as many as we can. If we cannot get to your question today, we will follow up with you directly to make sure that those questions are answered. Um, at the end of today's presentation, you will also receive an emailed copy of today's recording um, and the webinar and the PowerPoint that we used. So if you did miss anything or you needed to review something, that will be a resource to you. So with that being said, I would love to turn it over to Dr. Barbara Godolftis to dive into the public health program that we have available here. I wanna join Emily in welcoming you to the webinar for the Best Year MPH program. These are the objectives for today's webinar. I'll start by introducing myself. I'll share the mission of the MPH program and identify our program's approach. And Emily will tell you about the, mission, the admissions and application process, and both of us will be delighted to answer your questions. Um, as um, Emily said, I'm Barbara Goldoftis. I am the director of the MPH program. And like some of you, I had a first career. I um, was a science writer and a journalist, and I wrote, about the environment and public health, and I also taught writing about the environment and public health. At the same time, international work was another one of my passions, and I particularly worked in Central America and the Philippines. The Green Tiger, which was a book that I wrote about the research that I did in the Philippines and the human costs of ecological decline, um, is one of the ways that I became interested in public health. And while I was finishing the book, I applied for a mid-career uh, doctoral program in environmental health uh, and um, subsequently became a faculty member at Clark University where I developed a series of courses on public and environmental health. And I just finished my third year at Bastyr. I came here in 2015 to help launch the MPH program. I also have been working on research um, on type 2 diabetes in northern Nicaragua that I'll, we'll talk about later. Here are two photographs from my book on the Philippines from the Green Tiger that I'm including because for me they really serve as a bridge from my past work to today's work. The image on the left reminds me of how I came to work in public health. It's a, a, it's a scene from Manila and this scene was probably taken in the mid 1980s when the photographer Marissa Roth was covering the country for the New York Times. And during the period that I lived there, that boulevard was and the and the waterfront were ringed with with what were called squatter settlements, what we would call homeless settlements um, today, if in, in this country today. The photograph on the right is one of my favorites because it shows just how hard, how backbreaking the work is to transplant individual rice seedlings into flooded rice fields so that they can grow into the rice that, that, that sustains um, millions and millions of people in, in Asia. And that, um, I, I asked Marissa when I was looking at that photograph for the first time, how she got that angle, because you're really right there with the people. And she said, 
Well, Barbara, I got that angle by getting right there in the water with them. And she is, she's standing just a few feet away from where people are bent over transplanting those seedlings. And that photograph reminds me of the importance of standing with people where they are. And that is the community-based approach that we train our students to have in, in the MPH program. The mission of Bastyr University is to transform the health and well-being of the human community. And the mission of the Bastyr MPH program is to use a holistic approach to advance social justice and health and to promote individual, family, and community health through education, advocacy, community service, and research. Public health is fundamentally different from clinical work in some ways. The cl clinicians tend to focus on individuals. The classic question that a clinician asks is, why did this individual get this particular disease at this particular time? And in thinking about that question, they will think about the role of individual risk factors or what are called lifestyle choices. They might think about the person's diet, how active or inactive they are, whether or not they do what they're what the, what the clinician asks them to or suggests they do, whether they're, or not they're compliant. Maybe they'll think about genetic predisposition and they really focus on treatment. The public health perspective, on the other hand, focuses on what causes disease in populations. We ask, why are there disparities in different places, in different populations? Why is there much more heart disease or lung cancer in one place than in another? We, we look a lot at upstream determinants, the social, the psychosocial, the environmental determinants that influence the health of individuals and families and communities. And at those same levels, we also focus on prevention for individuals, for families, and for communities. And I also want to add that the public health perspective focuses less on healthcare because healthcare itself accounts for a re relatively small portion of the causes of ill health. So, what is public health itself? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention identify it as the science and practice of protecting, assessing, and improving the health of populations and their communities. They, um, public health looks at the promotion of health equity. It looks at prevention at all those same three levels. And it's not an exaggeration to say that public health saves lives every single day. So these maps um, are an example of how we might study patterns and disease as a way to think about improving management and improving prevention. So we look at disparities and these four maps show how diabetes has surged in the United States in a, just an eight year period. And so you can see the, the pale yellow is zero to 6.5% and the red is just a bit over 11%. And so you can see that there's patterns regionally and these data are at the county level. And there's also, there's just, there's clusters of place, places, particularly in the Southeast where the overall frequency of diabetes is much, much higher than in other parts of the, of the country. And here's another example that we use in the first quarters of the program. So this shows, a, this shows the rate of infectious disease mortality across the 1900s in the United States. And you can see there's a precipitous decline from 1900 until straight down until, until 1980. The, the, the spike right after World War one is the um, the flu pandemic of that era. And so it's really obvious why people are so concerned about there being another flu epidemic because of the just the dramatic surge in, in deaths in just a short period of time. And the inset box shows um, an increase in deaths from infectious disease in the early 80s, right after HIV and AIDS 
became um, were, were identified in this country. And you can see that for those for for those of us who lived through that period, we know that we lost a whole generation of of um, of gay men, of young gay men. And yet, when you look at the map, when you look at the at the slope overall, you can see that what was such a dramatic increase when we were living through it is actually very small given the, the entire downward trend since 1900. And that really shows what a dramatic, how dramatically lives have changed with the decline in infectious disease mortality in this country. So one of the things that we ask is, why did that, why did that happen? And here are some of the um, solutions, some of the answers that, that we, that people often give when we ask that question. They say, well, it's due to the use of, of antibiotics, but the first use of penicillin wasn't until the early 1940s, long after death, the death rate had, had declined. Or vaccinations, so obviously they, there's been a contribution, but again, those were introduced long after the death rate had declined. And what we see earlier on in the 1900s is the development of health departments and the use of chlorination in the water supply. And those, the basic public health measures, basic prevention, um, cleaning up of cities, probably garbage collection, all those parts of the public health infrastructure that we so take for granted and that are so important, um, they were what better nutrition, all of those factors, they were what caused the, the dramatic decline in the early 1900s and and are so and are, are still so important to the health of our of our overall population today the focus of the bastier mph program is community health education um, and which is the health the education of the public about health, about public health. The focus can be on individuals, it can be on families, it can be on communities, and it gives us a way in particular in this era of addressing the challenges of chronic diseases, which are much more important for both mortality and morbidity than infectious diseases, as you could see by the, by the previous slides. And community health education is really seen as a as a more, in many ways, as a more effective way to to target chronic diseases than than some clinical care um, can. So, where do community health educators work? It depends on what population is being targeted and how they're being targeted. So, some community health educators work in nonprofits. Some work in hospitals. Some work in schools and in school programs. Some work for the government, such as the the state um, or local health departments. Some work in industry in the private sector doing uh, employee wellness work. And there's other places that they can work as well. Now this slide gives um, a sampling of different kinds of visual community health education projects. Community health education has been used to educate us about a wide range of topics. As you can see here, um, everything from infectious diseases such as colds and STDs. Um, it includes work to promote key environmental health policies such as those that are so important protecting our air and water. The slides in the middle and upper right are from Cleveland when I was growing up and the air does not look like that any longer and it has not looked like that since the Clean Air Act was enacted decades ago. Community health education has been important in educating food service workers, food service workers, such as reminding them that they need to wash their hands and in helping to keep the food supply safe. And of course, it's been important in anti-smoking campaigns, campaigns about substance abuse, uh, campaigns about emerging diseases, and campaigns about health equity. Our program at uh, Bastier has a distinctive approach. As I mentioned, we focus on community health education, and we also deliberately integrate a range of different perspectives across the 
curriculum. We have an emphasis on social justice and health. And as I mentioned, we, we study disparities and inequities in both um, so risk factors and in health outcomes. We focus on at-risk populations and we talk a great deal about cultural humility, which I like to think of as really trying to get into the water with a community or with another group of people that you can really see them and you can understand them so that you're standing in the same water that they are. The determinants of health perspective is deeply embedded in the approach that we take in the best year MPH program. And so we'll talk about factors that, that affect individuals, such as the biology and the genetic, um, the genetic environment. We'll talk about factors that affect families, such as employment, working conditions, education, literacy, and we'll talk about factors that affect whole communities, such as the physical environment, such as social support systems, such as health services, um, and such as, such as policies. Who are our faculty and our students? The faculty come from a range of disciplines. The core faculty are um, Jonathan Olson, who is on the left, um, Dr. June Klubeck, and myself, and other faculty teach in the program, um, Dean Linnell Golden, which is the next image, and on the far right, um, Deb Fulton Kehoe. And we have we have other um, faculty as well teaching a range of, of electives. As for the MPH students, they're, they come from a wide range of backgrounds. They have a great variety of life stories and career histories, probably as varied as all of you who are listening at this, at this very moment. To give an overview of the program, it's a two-year program. The courses meet in the late afternoon and the evening to allow people to, to work or um, and such during during most of the day. There are dual degree options, so some people will study um, to be an ND at the same time that they are doing the MPH. In the first year, you'll mainly study um, methods courses, epidemiology, epidemiology and biostatistics, qualitative methods, which somehow got, got cut off there a little bit. There's a determinants of health sequence, biological determinants, social determinants, environmental determinants. And there's um, community health education courses, an introductory course, a program planning and implementation course, and a research methods course. Every, sem every quarter throughout the two years, there is a social justice and health seminar and there also are six credits of public health electives. In the second year, um, there is a course on evaluation of health education programs, which has become an increasingly important part of, of, of public health work. And there's also a public health systems leadership and administration course. As I mentioned, there are social justice and health seminars. There's a series of three capstone courses to help people move through their capstone project. And there are the public health electives again that I that I mentioned. Here is a sampling of public health electives, um, cultural health communication, public health for aging, grant proposal writing, there's current health issues and interventions. I teach a global health course. There's a course on public health legislative advocacy, a course on diabetes, and a course on um, the, the gut flora. The practicum, there are, there are two practice experiences. The first one is the practicum, which happens the summer after the first year, and it involves 200 hours of working at a, at, on community health education at a community site and students can do a range of, of projects, but they have to have one, a focus on one main project that involves community health education in some, in some capacity, which can be everything from a needs assessment to an evaluation. The capstone project takes place the second year. Sometimes it happens at the same site where the practicum was done and sometimes it happens at a different site. And it, um, it's the main master's project and it involves some portion of designing, implementing, and evaluating a community health education project. 
uh, where have best year MPH students done these, these uh, practice projects? Everything from the Poison Center to the Washington State Board of Health, um, the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, the Tribal Health Authority for the Puyallup Tribe, Youth Care, which, which works with homeless youth, several different hospitals, the Cabrini Ministry, Food Lifeline, American Heart Association, Foundation for Healthy Generations, and many, many more places. So is the MPH program a good fit for you? So questions to ask yourself, are you interested in a career in community health education and public health? Are you interested in prevention, including workplace wellness? Are you interested in promoting health for individuals, families, and communities? Are you interested in education and research aimed at prevention? And also, are you interested in advocacy for public health policies that affect the environment and health, and even the social, the social environment and health? If you answered yes to some of those questions, then we might be the absolute best match for you, and we encourage you to come to Best Year and to join us. I would like to now pass um, things on to Emily, who will talk about admissions. Perfect, thank you so much, Barbara. Your presentation is always so incredibly inspiring. Um, so before I head into the admissions information for this program, I do just want to remind everyone that's listening, if you do have any questions whatsoever about what Barbara has just discussed or anything that is coming to be discussed, please feel free to enter those on the side of your screen and we will definitely answer those questions at the end of the presentation. All right, so for admissions requirements, and Barbara, if you'll go ahead and proceed in the slideshow, perfect, thank you. So entering students must have a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited institution or university. This can also include international schools um, if they have been translated and evaluated to have also been of that accreditation. Students, we do ask that students come with a GPA of a 3.0 or higher in their undergraduate coursework. Um, so this is everything that you have done from high school on to graduation for your bachelor's. We also do require that we submit the GRE scores. Um, if you're not able to find where to take that or find any information, then I can help you on that. Um, we don't have any minimum score requirements at this time. Um, so everything is at, at your pace, studying, taking the exam, it just needs to be completed before you start the program each fall. The only specific course requirement for this program is we do ask that you take a statistics course with a 3.0, which is a B or higher. Um, once again, if you are not able to find the correct course or there's a lot of different choices in the school that you're attending, I'm more than happy to help you find that as well. All right, so the admissions process. The application process will include these following things. A complete application of our online application. Um, so all of our on applications are now online. It decreases um, the chance for error. And uh, we do ask that you fill out a personal statement of just a couple questions that we have asked about the program, making sure that it's correct for you and that it aligns with your goals and your future, as well as your professional resume. We also ask that you do submit um, all of your official college transcripts, even if you have attended three, four, five different colleges or universities, we do require that each individual transcripts are submitted to Best Year for the processing of your file. Letters of recommendation, we require two, one of which must be professional, the other academic, so a previous or um, current professor, and then also the GRE scores. This program is one that we do require an interview. Um, it can be in person or over Skype um, to have a face-to-face -face interview. Um, and those we definitely get scheduled as soon as we can. We're hoping for early March every year um, since the deadline for the application is February 1st. 
And this is my contact information as well as my picture. Um, if you do have any additional information, I'm more than happy to, to speak with you or email back and forth. The quickest way to get me on the phone is to call and schedule an advising appointment. That number here is on the screen. It is 425-602. 3332 and the front office answers that phone number. Um, they have full access to my calendar and scheduling advising appointments. We host them both in person and over the phone. So if you're not able to make it onto campus, we frequently advise over the phone and it's very, very successful. So this is the admissions timeline. Um, February 1st is the priority deadline for most of our master's degrees, including the public health degree. Once again, you do apply online. Um, we do not have any paper applications. We do have rolling admissions. So if you do apply late to this program, we accept applications all the way up until the start of the program. Um, it just gets a little bit um, condensed um, to get the in-person interview and all of those documents received. So we do suggest applying as soon as you feel that this is an interest to you. Um, and you can definitely apply while your prerequisites are still in progress. So if you have a scheduled date for the GRE or for your statistics class in order to complete those two, or even for your bachelor's degree, you can still apply to the program. And then just let me know that those are anticipated to be completed before the start of the fall program. April 15th is our um, university-wide best year application deadline. If you do apply or um, get accepted to the program after that date, that's that's fine as well. Um, it just may take a little bit longer for your application and your financial aid approval to, to get started. Late September this year, it's the 18th and 19th. Um, this is orientation for all of our new students. And then always the last week, the last full week of September is when our classes begin. Here is a sample schedule um, for the fall coming up. Um, this is, these are all of the courses. Obviously these are subject to change depending on the department um, and different class schedules that may um, arise, but this is just a sample schedule for you. Just to understand that um, evening course format and also the hybrid nature of the, of the courses. Letting you know that you are only on campus for about three nights per week. Um, um, and definitely just a couple hours. Um, this is the, over the next two slides. These are the program curriculums. Um, so this just goes through what is offered per quarter. So this is the fall quarter. And then winter, we get into epidemiology a little bit more as we did venture into it in the fall. And then environmental determinants, determinants of public health coming in the spring quarter. And then there's all, this is also available on the website um, with the credits and um, course descriptions as well. So as you can see in the year two, um, that is when typically you do start your practicum, practicum experience in public health. Um, so that is why we formulated this to be an evening course format. So we are um, available to get you into a practicum that is possibly going to be during the daytime on your second year approach. Um, and then dipping into the fall and winter quarters for your additional courses. You can add in these public health electives anytime, even during the first year if you'd like. And then there's the spring quarter. Um, so now is a great time to submit any last minute questions that you have about this entire presentation, any admissions questions, um, program questions, anything about the capstone. Um, and we do have a couple questions that were submitted to us during the presentation, so that's wonderful. 
Um, so the first question is, what is the ND degree? Um, so this is something that came up during Barbara's presentation, letting you know that this was something that you can do as a deal, dual track program. So the ND degree stands for naturopathic doctorate. Um, and so a lot of our students do come for this degree. Um, it is a four year track to become a naturopathic doctor. And during the second year of their track here on campus to become a naturopathic doctor, they usually add in, many of them add in this public health degree um, as a dual track program. All right, and second question, Barbara, this one will be for you. So concerning the practicum hours, does Bastyr University have assigned students to specific places? No, we don't assign students. We have a, we have a, a large number of sites um, where we've had students before and sites that we already have relationships with. But students can pick, as long as the site is appropriate, students can pick a site that's interesting for them. So each student works with their advisor to find out what, they, what kind of place they want to be. And they look at the sites that we already have, have agreements with. But um, every, every year so far, some of the students have gone on and found sites that were, that were different, that were something that they were interested. So no, there's, there's, there's a few, you have to be able to work with someone in, who has public health or community health education experience or training, and you have to work on community health education. But the, the sites are varied and there's a lot of, there's a lot of flexibility. And it's Great. a very, the students love the practicum. It's always, from my perspective, it's just really exciting to see people go out. I, I visit each site in the middle of the summer and hear about what they're doing. And then when they come back after the summer, after having had this 200 hour experience, and some of them actually will volunteer and spend additional hours working there. They just are so excited and they've, they've learned so much and learned how to apply so much of what they they worked hard to to learn about in the first year of coursework. It's a, it's a wonderful experience and then they take that and then move on to to the capstone and and also have a have a just a a really exciting time working on their own project. Perfect. Since you did mention the capstone quite a bit during that last question or answer, um, why don't you kind of tell us more about the capstone? What does it entail? What are some things that students are doing currently? Sure. It entails some um, portion of designing, implementing, and evaluating a community health education uh, project or program. So students have done many, many different things. One student uh, worked on a type 2 diabetes education program for a tribal health authority. Another one um, designed and implemented and evaluated mindfulness training for, um, for trainers who were working at a, um, a health club. And she felt that this was the audience she wanted to reach. And it was, it was very cutting edge and really, really interesting work. A student worked with the Department of Health to create an online education um, program about antibiotic resistance using a One Health perspective, bringing together um, animal, um, animal health, human health, ecological health. And it was, again, very cutting edge and, and super interesting. Some, um, a pair of students worked on a faith-based project, um, working with caregivers to educate them about trauma-informed care. Another student did an, um, a nutrition program for homeless youth. Another student did a, 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 a project about um, implementing social determinants of health among clinicians, and she she worked at she worked at a, at a hospital setting to do that. So those are some of the. It's just a wide wide variety, and each student finds their own particular interest, and and we work because it's a small um, 
program, we're able to work individually with each student to help them develop and find their, their, their passion and their focus. That is wonderful. Thank you. Um, so this question is also something that came up during the presentation. So what other job opportunities are for people who hold an MPH other than a health educator? I am interested in working in epi epidemiology and will the program help me work in this field? It, it will not, it will give you a, um, there's, two epi courses and two biostats courses and then a um, research methods course and an evaluation course and those are the methods those are the main methods courses in addition the qualitative so we have a mixed we have a mixed methods perspective so it will not train you to 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 be sort of a full-blown epidemiologist which you would need more than less than a year of coursework in epidemiology for. But I know I train myself with MPH students who who took one or two epi courses and did end up doing epidemiologic work. Did they did end up doing that kind of analysis um, as a as a job. So there's some basic epi, but it's this is not this is not a master of science in epidemiology. And I should add that I'm an environmental epidemiologist, so that's the perspective that I bring to all of my, all of the courses that I teach. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so why don't we jump into, can you tell us some jobs that some of our graduates have gotten um, after, or have received after graduating from this program? Absolutely, as I mentioned, there's a wide range of of places that students can work, every place, everywhere from nonprofits to hospitals to the government. And here are a couple of jobs that that um, students from our first cohort are working at. One student is a research site coordinator for a suicide prevention program at the Urban Indian Health Institute, which was the job that, which was really what she wanted to do when she when she came and she organized her practicum and her capstone. Um, to to point in that direction, and it's a very it was a very exciting um, position for her to be able to take on. Another one is the community liaison for substance abuse youth prevention program in one of the more rural counties, which again was something that was very interesting for her, and it, it gives her an involvement in um, both policy work and community work, which was something that 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 she wanted as well. That is wonderful. That's wonderful news that our graduates are getting some job positions out there and affecting the world. So how about our accreditation status, um, professional accreditation with CEPH, and where are we in that? We have submitted our application as a new program, and we are accepted to move forward in the accreditation process. And um, the best way to find out about it is to look at the website for the Council on Education and Public Health, which is ceph.org, C-E-P-H dot org. And you can see the, the long list of programs and schools that are currently going through the accreditation process, and you'll see best year listed. And that's really the best way to find out about what the process is and um, and what the stages of it are. That is wonderful. Um, so a common question that we usually get is, is Bastyr, um, this public health program, financial aid eligible? And the answer is yes. Um, our financial aid department is available to you both before, during, and after you become a student or graduate of a program here. And they can be reached at Fin aid at bastier.edu. So that's F-I-N-A-I-D at bastier.edu. An appointment can also be made by setting up an appointment with a financial aid advisor just by calling this same number um, for our student services and reception, this 3332 number. Um, 
how about are there any jobs available on campus? Um, so that is a definite yes as well. We have a lot of work study available um, on campus for our students to find some jobs um, while they're attending some classes. There is there's jobs in registrar and admissions um, as a tutor on campus for anything that you excel in and want to help others um, understand the subject a little bit better. There's also jobs in the garden, in HR. Um, if you are interested in finding a, a job on campus, we can definitely help you find one that interests you. All right, so another common question that we have is how much does the program cost? So this is um, a, a program with a lower, lower cost because it is the hybrid format. So with that said, it is with books and supplies estimated to be included in that. It does come up to be just under 25,000 um, for one year on campus. And that is just an estimate coming into this next fall quarter, if you or fall start program, if you are interested in starting on a later date, definitely check on that tuition um, a, a, an additional time. And I just I just wanted to add that the because I didn't get into it that much earlier, the hybrid program means that for some courses, a portion of the course time is actually done online. So for say a, a five credit course that I teach an hour of the class each week is is done online instead of together in the classroom. And that makes it a little bit more manageable for students who are working or have other responsibilities during the day. Perfect. All right, another question that we have is, do any of your current students also work during the program? Are you familiar with that? Yes, many of our students are working. Some of them are working full-time, some of them are working part-time. It's my observation that it's a little bit easier for people who are not working full to 40 hours a week just because to work 40 hours a week and then to have several to have hours of classes at night three nights a week the first year and two nights a week the second year it can be all it can be a lot but um people people do it and some people actually choose to work to, to shift the, their hours around so that they may work more hours at one point and fewer hours at another point and i've seen that over over all the cohorts that we that we've had and people figure it out but mo again most of the students are also working and we have tried with our scheduling to to really accommodate that i also want to add that when i said that students come from a range of backgrounds they also are a range of ages and so people come from different parts of the country they come they're in different stages of life and it makes the it it um, and they're juggling different kinds of responsibilities and so it, it actually makes for a very really interesting classroom experience. How about, are there any parents in uh, the public health program currently? There are, and that's one of the other things that some of the people are doing during the day. So we have we have a number of students who have, who have children and children of a range of ages. Very nice, so they are able to make that work. Perfect. Yes, absolutely. All right, well, that concludes our questions for the presentation. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, um, which we still have some time left, so if you have any last minute questions, go ahead and send those through. We would love to thank you so much for your time and joining us today um, for this webinar. And thank you as well, Barbara, for your time and wonderful, incredibly inspiring presentation. Thank you, and we um, we hope to see some of you at um, at Bastyr either this fall or next fall. Perfect. And also, please know that we are having an on-campus event this coming August 11th, 2018. It is an all-day event, and Barbara and I will both be there, um, or a representative for the public health program will be there um, to meet face-to-face, -face, talk to you about your goals, interests, and of course, answer any questions that you might have apart from today. 
You can feel free to register any time for this event, and it's really easy to do so. Just go to www.bastier.edu slash discover Bastier. That's D-I-S-C-O-V-E-R-B-A-S-T-Y-R. All right, so in the meantime, once again, feel free to contact us anytime if you would like to schedule an advising appointment or financial aid appointment um, for any future admissions questions or visit our website for any future admissions events as well. We frequently hold webinars and host at least four events per year, depending on the program that you're interested in. Thank you all so much once again, and we so much look forward to hearing from you in the future. Have a wonderful day, and we look forward to hearing from you.